Welcome back everyone. In today's video, we will be looking at the games that I played in the State Scholastic High School Tournament qualifying for the Denker Tournament of High School National Champions, which will be held in Virginia um, later this year in the summer. So this tournament is five rounds and we're going to look at the first three rounds today and the net last two rounds in another video. And the thing with this tournament is that there are a lot of players who are much lower rated than me, which means that I need to be very careful not to draw or lose any games, because not only would that kill my rating, that would also probably hurt my chances to win the tournament. So I need to make sure that I don't uh, completely forget how to play chess. Spoiler alert, spoiler alert I did. So um, hopefully that didn't cause me to actually lose any games, but we will find out. So in this first game, I'm paired against about a 700, but the thing with Idaho is that everyone is underrated, and you really don't know uh, how good your opponents are, just by looking at a number. But anyways, uh, we get e4, c5, knight f3, g6, we get the accelerated dragon, and we get this line with queen a5, and I've mentioned a lot in the uh, videos that this, is, this line is very, very tricky, there's a lot of ways to make mistakes. Um, my opponent castles, which is the best move, but after that, um, his luck runs out, and queen d2 is a blunder. And the reason it's a blunder is because I can take this knight first. If my opponent takes with the queen, I play knight 2g4, attacking the bishop, and I would get the two bishops, which is a pretty good advantage. If my opponent takes with the bishop, as he did in the game, I can actually win a pawn. And you can pause the video to see how to win a pawn. After I told you that I can win a pawn, it's probably pretty obvious what the move is. Um, it's probably not something like queen takes a2 and moving the queen back. Um, that is a way to win a pawn temporarily, but the move is knight takes e4. So if you found this move and you calculated all the variations, congratulations, this is how you win a pawn for free. Okay, and the next real test for me is what where to put my bishop after pawn to c3. So you can pause the video again and decide where you would put the bishop out of uh, these six squares. And also, try to decide for yourself which square is the worst square to put the bishop? Positionally. Okay, so if you said bishop two, f six, g seven, or h eight, um, those are all those are the yeah, those are the top three moves. So the idea is you've got to stay on this diagonal. It's very important. And what I did is I went to b six, the worst square, because I'm really bad at chess. And the reason it's such a bad square is because not only does it not cover the center squares uh, d four and e five. It also blocks this B pawn, which just slows down my queen side advancing, and it makes it difficult to develop my light squared bishop. So I should have went back to G7, and now after knight to F3, which is what a natural move, I'm covering the squares that, knight, that the knight wants to jump to, and I can also play B5 more quickly. Instead, I go bishop to B6, because I was falling asleep. Um, it was like 9 a.m., Okay, uh, rook to e1, now I play d5, attacking the bishop. I'm trying to bait my opponent into falling into this skewer, um, but he goes back. Now I play e6, and now my opponent does play this knight to f3 idea, activating the knight. So overall, my opponent's playing pretty well here, other than a blunder, with, which like a three-move blunder of a pawn. And he's making it difficult for me and punishing my positional mistakes with bishop to b6. Now he's going to try to jump into e5. So I go bishop to c7 to stop it. Um, rook to d1, another good move. Rook on, putting the rook on the open file, stopping my pawn advancements. b5, it's, it's very important for me to stop c4. Because if I allow it, then my opponent can actually work on this uh, open file. And my extra pawn isn't as relevant, and it's going to take a long time to win this game. Yeah, so I want to keep this uh, in balance on the queen side with the space advantage. Uh, knight to d4, bishop d7, protecting the pawn, bishop, d, uh, bishop to c2, a nice move. Uh, trying to rewrite the bishop, but uh, actually his idea was to, it was to play b4, which is not a good move. Which And so it's not a good move for a couple of reasons. First of all, it weakens the c3 pawn, it's now a backward pawn, because no pawn but... No pawns behind it can ever protect it again because pawns cannot move backwards. And this is going to be a target. So I can also play a4, creating a lever. And a lever is when you take a pawn and open a file. That's called a that's called a lever. Or is it called a hook? I think a hook is where you push a pawn and you can put, attack it like this. So a lever is when you can open up a file. 
So my opponent plays a3, now I take, now I have an open file, and logically I should play rook to a3, because it not only occupies the file, allows me to double stack on it, it also attacks this pawn. So no reason not to play it, right? Well, uh, I actually play bishop to, Z, bishop to b6 because I have no idea what I'm doing. So I just over overthought this position completely. I thought I had to stop the knight from going to c5 for some reason. Um, my opponent can just play bishop to d3 here and attack this pawn. Now I have to take. And now it's now it's really not looking so good for winning chances. I'm probably still winning, but now I just delayed my I just delayed my uh, my break for like. 30 more minutes if my opponent does this. Okay, but anyways, um, after bishop b6, we get rook to a1, and now I play another horrible move, which is rook takes a1. This is like... This is just not a good move. Um, you should, there's no reason to allow my opponent to get the open file when I can just play rook e to c8, which is my idea anyways to attack this pawn. Now if my opponent takes, I just get the open file. So I take and I go rook c8, which is... I guess still okay, but now I have to place knight back. Um, e5, trying to play d4, rook a6, attacking the bishop, another pretty good move. Rook c6, and now I have a I have a couple threats. First of all, I want to go rook f6, which I did not see in the game, but this is this does exist. But mainly I want to defend my bishop, and I want to threaten bishop takes f2, which would be a discovered attack on the rook. So what my opponent has to do is check me first, and then try to attack this pawn. But then I can play rook to f6 and attack this pawn. And instead what happens is he plays bishop to d3 first, which allows me to win the exchange. And then the game ends shortly after. But not actually shortly after, because my opponent didn't resign. But um, I, I did get away with um, some poor positional play, and I still won this game, which is the most important thing. Okay, so let's go on to the next game. In this game I'm white, and my opponent is about 900, but again that doesn't really mean much. So I play e4. Uh, we got the Karakon, which I'm happy to see. I score pretty well against the Karakon. Especially this variation where I just get a better pawn structure out of the opening. So when you have a better pawn structure, it's good to trade pieces into an endgame because the fewer pieces are on the board, the more important pawn structure is. So uh, play c3, bishop d3, I'm just trying to trade pieces, bishop to f4. And um, what I've noticed with a lot of these players, uh, raid players like uh, around 1,000, in Idaho at least, is whenever they are able to trade, they trade. And this I mean, it makes it makes sense to trade sometimes. Like you're not losing material. If you trade your piece, you can't blunder it later. But um, but more seriously, you're just activating your opponent's pieces. So what my opponent should do instead is just keep uh, improving his improving his pieces and if I want to trade, then he can activate his pieces. So my opponent trades, knight to b6, trying to go to d5, but the correct way to put the knight is over here on the king side, not only protecting, but also uh, preparing to uh, come in over here. So I put, uh, challenge the file with my rook, and now my opponent plays knight d5, which allows me to trade, trade, and these are actually good trades with a purpose, because I can play queen to h5, forking two pawns. So I'm forking two pawns, but I'm not actually winning a pawn immediately, because my opponent does have a resource. So you can pause the video and try to see how can black avoid losing a pawn uh, immediately? So if you saw f5, that is correct. I can uh, take, but after g6, that's actually a fork. So I'd have to play queen to f3, and I have a better pawn structure still. d5 is a permanent weakness, um, but at least black's not down a pawn immediately. So my hope plays g6 instead, I take a pawn, and then a bunch of trades happen, and I take a bunch more pawns, and I, I win the game. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, so I'm black now. In round three, uh, we get the Grand Prix attack. My opponent's pushing two pawns over here. I just play this same uh, dragon setup because it's probably just okay. I play knight to d4. I have good control of this square. Takes, takes, knight back. I play knight f6, more developing moves, and my opponent blunders a bishop, and that's basically how the game ends. So that was the first uh, three. That was the first three rounds. Um, three out of three. So couldn't really ask for a better score. Magnus would probably Mag Magnus would probably get like three and a half out of three, but Hey, um, I'm not him. Um, what do you want? What do you? What more do you want than three out of three? So this is pretty good. Um, four rounds, four and five were more eventful games. So we'll look at that in our next video. Thank you for watching, and I will see you in rounds four and five.